Welcome to RPTV Weekly News Show. My name is Murphy Brown, and my co-hosts are Fred Alvarado, Javen Hawk, and today we welcome Corbin Milo and Anna Maria Iguera. We present news that impacts Regent Park and the surrounding areas. In this episode, we present the following news for the week of December 8th, to December 14th, 2021. City of Toronto opens warming centers for those experiencing homelessness. Mustafa the Poet live at Mossy Hall. Report of the December 7th SDP stakeholders meeting. Regent Park Youth Community Meeting with Toronto Police. YSM holds a consultation for a new center. Honoring December 6th Nation Day of Remembrance and Action. Ontario COVID-19 modeling suggests province will see rise in cases. Events and jobs in Regent Park community. City of Toronto opens warming centers for those experiencing homelessness. Four warming centers will be open beginning at 7 p.m. to give those who are vulnerable and may be experiencing homelessness a safe, warm indoor place, the city said in a release on Monday. Residents will have access to food, washrooms, and referrals to emergency shelter. The four warming center locations are 129 Peter Street, 5800 Yon Street, the Better Living Center at Exhibition Place at 195 Princess Boulevard, the Scarborough Civic Center at 150 Borough Drive. There will be around 350 spaces available and beds are there for both single individuals and couples. To you. And today we welcome Corbin Milo with a report on Mustafa the Poet live at Masi On the 4th of December in 2021, Mustafa the Poet performed at Massey Hall in downtown Toronto. Not many artists get to play their first hometown concert at the prestigious venue, Massey Hall. For Mustafa, the location was even more significant than most. It's a walk away from Regent Park, the Toronto neighborhood that looms over all the songs on Mustafa's debut album, When Smoke Rises. It was lovely. It was absolutely magical. It was a lot of, I think, transformative healing and different ways to do that. Do that. And very candid conversations about Toronto and the reality and experiences of racialized young men, particularly black young men. And I don't think we have enough of those conversations. He's a beautiful writer. He's a poet. I mean, like, you can't help but love and relate to what he says, even though, like, my experience was not his, but he shares his with a lot of generosity and a lot of sincerity. It was lovely. The concert was beautiful, I'm not going to lie. It was very beautiful, it was very touching. It's me being from Regent Park, so, like, it was really good to, you know, see him. I'm very proud of him, you know. Uh, it was a really good concert, though. I'm very proud of him, very touching, really good vibes all the time. Very funny jokes, you know, so yeah, I'm very happy. I'm very happy with the concert. I think Hers being one of my favorite songs from him, uh, it's just really moving and touching, you know. It's very, it hits very close to home, and I think it hits very close to home for everyone who's part of the neighborhood, who lives in the neighborhood, right? Mustafa's album is a tribute to his friends and family and their lives spent in Regent Park. The full capacity crowd was full of Regent Park youth and Mustafa's friends and family including the families of Ali and Smoke Dog. He told the audience that having those folks in the audience was more overwhelming than the venue itself. At one point, Mustafa shouted, Regent Park is in the house, which received a roaring response. He also mentioned that Massey Hall is across the street from the trauma center at St. Michael's Hospital, which many Regent Parkers are familiar with due to the gun violence and hard life in the Regent Park community. Daniels and Tridal, in partnership with TCHC, jointly provided 100 tickets for youth involving youth serving organizations of Regent Park, including Healing as One, Kiwani's Boys and Girls Club, Focus Media Arts Center, Young Street Mission, and Shoot for Peace. Transportation in the form of three school buses from Regent Park to and from Massey Hall was also arranged as well as snacks before getting on the buses.
By all accounts, the youth of Regent Park was very excited about the concert. They felt proud to see one of their own making good. My name is Diane Mohammed. I'm a Regent Park resident. And today I am going on a, uh, on a field trip riding a school bus. It's the first time I've been in a school bus since I was So many years ago. I'm honest, I don't know. <laughs> We're going to the Mustafa concert. We know Mustafa is a uh, folk singer songwriter uh, from Regent. And uh, he is having a concert at Massey Hall. Massey Hall. We got a bunch of free tickets, and I already like folk music, and I just have to make good folk music. So, that's where Yeah. Hi, guys. Are you excited? Uh, so we're going to have a lot of fun at this concert. Um, thank you to Regent Park Focus and Mustafa the Poet. Thank you. Hello, my name is Noah, and uh, I'm very excited to go to the Mustafa the Poet concert. I hope we have a great time, and yeah, I'm very happy. My name is Prohor, and I'm extremely excited. To, to listen to this uh, artist in Ranger Park, and I hope to see you guys there. We're here in front of Macy Hall, ready to see the amazing Mustafa the Poet. He's from our very own Ranger Park, and we're here to see his concert. It's going to be amazing. By all accounts, the youth of Regent Park was very excited about the concert. They felt proud to see one of their own making good. The concert was about creating that space to mourn and heal collectively. It was a heavy night, but also a beautiful one. For some people, it was emotional. For some, it was mesmerizing. And for some, it was Regent Park in poems. Report of the December 7th, 2021 SDP Stakeholders Meeting. The Regent Park Social Development Plan is a community-wide initiative aimed at fostering social inclusion and cohesion the SDP Stakeholders Table is the main decision-making body responsible for the implementation of Social Development Plan. The Stakeholders Committee meets four times yearly. Here to talk about the membership of the SDP Stakeholders Table is Fred Alvarado. Thank you, Murphy. Intended to be a coalition of stakeholders serving or residing in Regent Park, participation on the stakeholders table is open to anyone including market and TCHC residents, agencies, grassroots groups, faith groups, and business located in or serving Regent Park. TCHC and its development partners, City of Toronto, and elected representatives serving Regent Park. While membership is open to all, voting privileges are restricting to residents and stakeholder groups who are actively involved on the various working committees of the SDP. The working committees are communications, community building, safety, employment and economic development, community benefits, funding and resources, evaluation and benchmarks in terms of reference. Finally, the SDP Stakeholder Sable is coordinated by a planning committee. If you are a resident or a stakeholder group and is interested in becoming a member and getting involved in any of the SDP committees, please contact Lindsay Jackson at Toronto.ca. Back to you, Murphy. The December 7th, 2021 online Zoom meeting of the Regent Park Stakeholder Stable was chaired by SDP co-chairs Marlene Dijanova, representing RPNA market residents, and Greg Gary, the executive director of Kiwani's Boys and Girls Club, representing the executive director's network. 47 people attended the meeting. Greg Gary began the meeting with a welcome and introductions. As part of the introductions, Greg informed the table that Lloyd Pike, a former TCHC resident co-chair of the SDP, was transitioning out of the position and will be replaced by Ismail Afra the new TCHC resident co-chair. According to Greg, Ismail will officially begin 
taken on his responsibilities after that night's meeting and would be involved in co-chairing the next SDP stakeholders table meeting. Greg also mentioned that there was a possibility that Lloyd Pike could continue as a chair occupying a vacant position, but the details of that position is still under review. Later in the meeting, Murshida Muin, a resident involved on, community, on the Community Building Committee, returned to the question of the co-chair positions and how people are appointed slash selected. Murshida called for a more transparent and open process for selecting chairs. Greg indicated that the planning committee will review the selection process for chairs and make sure that the process was transparent. After the introductions, Marlene read the land acknowledgement and the per purpose of the SDP. Following the purpose, Marlene presented the evening's agenda. The first item on the agenda was a funding update. Diana Mabunduse, an agency representative of Dixon Hall and a member of the planning committee, reported on the SDP vision in session that was held on September 22, 2021. This session was held to inform residents on how they can access funding for project ideas related to the priority areas of the SDP. Over 80 residents attended the visioning session. In addition to the visioning, Lindsay Jackson, a community development staff member from the city who helps facilitate the SDP, reported that a general survey went out into the community related to the funding ideas. The survey was completed by 135 residents via online and face-to-face -face through the help of TCHC outreach staff. According to Lindsay, the survey was used to help both the committees and individual residents get a sense of resident priorities and inform the development of project proposals. Following Diana's presentation, Michael Rosenberg, a member of the Community Building and SDP Planning Committee, reported on the deep dive process held in October. The deep dive was a process for reviewing new and continuing project proposals for 2021 funding year. At the end of the process, a total of 10 projects were recommended to the city for funding in the amount of $500,000. The recommended projects were Youth Empower Youth, YEY, Building Leaders for Change, Youth Enrichment Academy, YEA, Regent Park TV, Howlers Kitchen Food School, SDP Promotions, Women's Engagement, Women's Health Social Circle, RP Tours, and Healing as One. Following Michael's report, Lindsay Jackson continued the agenda on funding by reporting on the Community Engagement, Capacity Building, and Support Fund, also known as the 50K Fund. Lindsay reported that this year, the 50,000 fund that is administered by the city will be allocated the following five areas. One, SDP administrative coordinator, 15 hours weekly, position closes January 4th, 2022. Number two, capacity building workshops to strengthen residents' skills. Number three, the establishment of a SDP youth committee to engage youth in the SDP and help define the criteria of an upcoming youth grant designed for Regent Park. Number four, barrier reduction funds, such as childcare, translations, and food. Number five, resident engagement events. 
to help more marginalized groups to participate in the SDP, the priority in seniors, disability, and language barriers. Following Lindsay's report, a debate on procedure took place when Walid Kogali, a resident member, requested to add discussion on the agenda of a November 25th incident involving community youth and police. Greg, the co-chair, decided that Walid's item would be discussed at the end of the meeting and Kevin was invited to begin his presentation. Kevin's presentation was a proposal related to the Regent Park Athletic Grounds. According to Kevin, the city recreation has an outdated permitting system where it's grandfathers and favors past permit holders before granting to new groups on a first come and first serve basis. Kevin claims this process does not serve the community and there's only a 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. slot that the city has designated for Regent Park community use. Kevin claimed lots of groups want to use the field and it is packed with various activities including soccer, flag, football, frisbee. Kevin claims that community groups find it difficult to access the 4 to 8 p.m. community time. Kevin is interested in the development of community-managed athletic grounds to make it easier for Regent Park grassroots groups and programs to access the field. Kevin also wants to build a dome so that all seasonal programming could happen on the field. To help with the cost, maintenance, and sustainability, Kevin proposes that half of the field could be used by Regent Park groups and the other half could be rented out. Kevin argues that the, the city is already looking at building domes on 10 athletic grounds across the city. Although Regent Park is not current, consider he feels this is something the community can advocate for. According to Kevin, the cost of the dome and its construction will total just over $3 million. Lucky Booth, a manager of City of Toronto Parks, Forestry and Recreation, and whose responsibility includes the Regent Park Athletic Grounds, was on hand to present the city's perspective towards issues raised in Kevin's presentation. Contrary to Kevin's belief that the field is only available for Regent Park community use from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. daily, Lucky informed members that the actual use of the field for Regent Park designated groups is from 9 a.m. to 8 p.m. daily and that external use of the field by outside groups is only from 8 p.m. to 10 p.m. Lucky argued that this was intentional to ensure community access. Much of the programming on the field is run by city staff. Lucky went on to say that the Regent Park athletic field is not a full-size field. The field was intentionally designed to prevent competitive games and maintain a community focus. And because it is communal, multiple activities take place on the field at the same time. As a result, his staff discourages full team sports such as 11 on 11 soccer. Responding to concerns that the use of the field has barriers, Lucky argued that local folks that wish to use the field simply have to walk into the Regent Park Community Center and ask staff. They would be given paperwork indicating their use of the field. In fact, prior to COVID, the city held information meetings to inform local groups of the process. But unfortunately, because of COVID, these information sessions have not been done in the past 
two years during a discussion to a youth from Regent Park who are now involved with Kevin indicated that they had trouble permitting the field. Lucky offered to meet with them to identify the barriers they had. Regarding the dome, Lucky went on to say that because it is not a full-size field, he does not know the feasibility of creating a dome because it would just make the field smaller. He encourages that a feasibility study be done. Despite Lucky's clarification, in response to questions, Kevin indicated that he is still interested in pursuing a community governance model. For example, a not-for-profit group for managing the field. Ismail Afra raised a question to Lucky related to the community building working group desire to develop an advisory related to recreation access. Lucky indicated that in the past, there was a community advisory committee for the former community center and that he is very much interested in developing an advisory body for all the recreation facilities in Regent Park that can advise the City of Toronto Parks, Forestry and Recreation on how they serve the community. The final agenda item was presented by Ibrahim Afra related to the annual SDP progress report. According to Ibrahim, the SDP progress report is scheduled for February 8, 2022. Ibrahim presented a proposal to combine the progress report with a celebration that would be held at the Daniel Center. Members were invited to get involved in the planning of the event. This completes the report of the December 7, 2021 meeting of the SDP stakeholders table. And now Ana Maria Iguera will report on the Regent Park Youth Community Meeting with Toronto Police. Thank you, Murphy. On Thursday, December 2nd, the Regent Park Youth Community and Toronto Metropolitan Police from 51 Division and the Toronto Metropolitan Police Youth Engagement Unit held a conversation session at the 402 Shooter Street Community Centre about gun and gang violence in Regent Park and how this has impacted the youth in the community. The main purpose of this first dialogue was to listen from the youth about their concerns and thoughts on how to tackle gun violence and engage the young people to be the voice in their community and influence positively in combating problems in the neighborhood, such as lack of opportunities and systemic racism. The meeting was facilitated by Isabel Cotton, a police youth engagement officer. Officer Cotton began the session by introducing the panel, including Tor Toronto Police Superintendent David Ridzik, 51 Division Unit Commander Chris Kirkpatrick, 51 Division Second in Charge Angad Veer Singh, and Neighborhood Poli Police Officer Farzad Godby, and Mustafa Papalzai, and guest speakers. Toronto Police emphasized the importance of this discussion and their willingness to listen to the youth perspectives and take their advice on how to tackle gun violence. The reason we're here tonight at the community centre is we're having a little session with the youth in relation to gun violence in Regent Park and how it's impacted the, the youth. And we have the youth here to talk about their lived experiences. Tonight is all about the youth and the community. It's not about the police, it's not about anyone else, it's all about the youth. We want to see their perspective, we want to see what they are thinking and how they can come probably with uh, some suggestions or ideas to uh, fight the gun violence that has been uh, uh, happening uh, in Regent Park for many years now. And that's the purpose that we're all gathered together to uh, read the minds of our youth and see what they have to say in relation to the gun violence. One of the most important things that we've missed in the past couple of years due to COVID and the pandemic is the, uh, the relationships that we had ongoing. Obviously with the pandemic, we lost some of those relationships. So we need to uh, reconnect and uh, collaborate and um, basically bring the community back together and work together as, as one. And this is the reason why we're here, to participate 
and mainly to listen to the youth to see what they have to say and they can provide us some of the solutions to this gun violence and we can work together moving forward. The children and the youth are our future and we need to listen to them. And tonight uh, they have the chance to speak their minds uh, and, and for us as police officers a time to listen, a time to listen to what they have to say and a, a time where we can learn from them. We have a lot to learn from the community, especially the youth who are, we have a lot of bright students, a lot of uh, bright prospects out of uh, Region Park, and it's just a chance for us to listen to them and learn from them. Hey, how you doing? My name is Jason. I'm with the Black Community Consultative with TPS. Um, and we're here downtown today at the Region Park Community Center, and it's to um, connect with the youth and engage with the youth with about gun violence and how to be safe and how to go about things in a different way and events that happen like this is very important for the youth because a lot of them don't have um, family or a lot of them don't have, have mentors around them and a lot of the things that happens is they get caught up in gangs, they get caught up in situations that, allow, that allows them to do well, don't go down the road and bad things happen. Not every youth and not everybody wants to be on that road to do bad things or get arrested so right now we are connecting the youth is connecting with the police officers, building a rapport, and what they're doing is, is showing um, that they're willing to work and the police officers are willing to work with the community. Toronto Police took the opportunity to share a PowerPoint presentation about their pilot project, Engage 416. This program is an expansion and new component of the Toronto Police Services greater gang prevention strategy that focuses on implementing appropriate education, prevention, intervention, and suppression strategies and initiatives focused on the reduction of guns and gangs, sexual violence and harassment, and human trafficking. The project has five core strategies. One, community mobilization, two, opportunities provision, three, social intervention, four, suppression, five, org organizational change and development. Because it is a pilot project, it is only focused on 12 division, 23 division, and 31 division. During the pilot project presentation, one of the members of the youth community raised her voice to ask, is this a conversation where everyone has an opinion or is this something where you guys are pushing an agenda and say this is what you want us to do? You should listen more. It doesn't feel like a conversation it feels like if you're listening to answer and not to understand, she said. In response to the youth intervention, Inspector Singh from 51 Division said, the reason why we are here today is momentum. The reason why we're here today is momentum. And I told you, you know what, and you're bang on. We're listening. Mm -hmm. And I ask you to be part of the solution, not just me, everybody here. And you know what, thank you for bringing that up because that's how, these conversations are very difficult, but they need to be had. No, People need to get uncomfortable. Another member of the youth community took the opportunity to share his thoughts by saying, we have to be comfortable, to be uncomfortable, to hear the truth that you don't want to hear. When a shooting happens in Regent Park, do you think John Tory comes down here, does a fundraiser, goes on a camera and says, this shooting shouldn't be happening here? When there was a shooting in Danforth, he did the biggest fundraiser in the community of Danforth. He went on TV and said, this shouldn't be happening. So where should it be happening? In Regent Park? When you want to address certain things, you go straight to the source. Go straight to John Tory and tell him 
Why don't you do that in Regent Park or Jane and Finch in predominantly black neighborhoods where black lives don't matter? That's what black people are seeing in the community, that John Tory is not caring about black people. Doug Ford doesn't care about black people. If you're saying that you guys are going to correct the wrong and you want us to open up to you, so correct the wrong. How many wrongs have to be done before something is corrected? How many people have to lose their lives before something is corrected? How many times do we have to feel like that we are hopeless because of our skin color and the way society judges us, he questioned. Walid Kogali, a member of the Regent Park Neighborhood Association, shared this point of view. Let's remember that this community went through trauma. We recently lost someone I know. He worked in this community center. His name was Thane. He was gunned down on my street. He was gunned down in a park that my family and friends go to every day. Do you know how many people feel unsafe knowing that at any moment, someone that they care about could just be killed? And then a couple of weeks later, when our youth were engaged in the revitalization to discuss about the community space. Someone made a prank call and a heavy presence of heavily armed police officers showed up and all they did is traumatize our youth. All they did was make people feel like they're criminals. The reason why I'm here is to support our youth uh, who had a very traumatizing experience uh, not too long ago, in fact two Sundays ago, uh, and we're hoping to uh, basically change the way interactions happen in our community between our youth and uh, police uh, enforcement or police services, and also challenge how safety is delivered in our community. Um, a lot of members of our community were traumatized uh, by the excessive uh, show of force uh, that occurred on Sunday and what we're hoping to do is change that dynamic for the better and also we're going to be reaching out to the youth who are impacted and the community members that were impacted to better support them uh, with any supports they may require. Uh, I know it's very traumatizing. The criminalization of black bodies, whether you see it or not, is impacting people living in our community. And what we want is action, not rhetoric, Walid said. The conversation was brought again to the recent violence that has affected the Regent Park community and how to support the families that were involved or separated because of gun violence. Toronto Police is willing to continue these conversations in future meetings to amplify the community's voice and committed themselves to request Mayor John Tory to be part of the next discussion. Despite a November 25th incident in which police responded aggressively to a report on youth knocking on resident doors at 50 Regent Boulevard, the incident was not raised at the meeting. And we continue with Corbin Milo with a report on YSM holds a consultation for a new center. The Young Street Mission, YSM, is a Toronto-based Christian development agency that opened its doors in 1896. 2021 marked YSM's 125th anniversary, working inside and amongst Toronto's communities. Today, they run programs year-round that cater to adults facing poverty, street-involved youth, families in need, and resident-led community development. On November 25, 2021, YSM held its first public consultation via Zoom regarding an exciting new project, the building of a proposed mixed-use dwelling in Toronto Centre's core. Aptly named the Opportunity Centre, 306-310 Gerard Street East will offer programming, housing, 
spaces for public gatherings, and offices for YSM staff. The site will share retail and community meeting spaces on its ground floor. The second floor will contain YSM staff offices, another level of retail space, and the first of 191 affordable residential units. In total, the building will stand 10 stories tall. It will offer both private and public amenities for residents and visiting community members alike. The proposed design involves an open courtyard connecting the Regent Park and Cabbage Town South neighborhoods. At the meeting, YSM announced its collaboration with New Commons Development, a nonprofit real estate development company that builds and preserves affordable housing and community real estate. To date, focus groups were conducted for resident committees and community agencies from Regent Park, Cabbage Town, St. James Town, Church in Wellesley, and Ryerson University. An impassioned question and answer period gave way to 20 minute breakout rooms for comments and concerns. Attendees raised questions regarding affordable rental rates, local employment opportunities, and whether consideration will be given to current occupants of older YSM properties. Much of these concerns could only be noted in these early stages. Future consultations may prove more fruitful for these important discussions as funding details become available. The potential for the Opportunity Center on Gerard Street East is profound. Its transit-friendly location offers easy access by community members of all ages. With the population of Ward 13 growing, the public's input can tailor the programs and services to be offered at this site come 2026. Another public consultation is planned for the spring of 2022. Honoring December 6th Nation Day of Remembrance and Action. On Monday, December 6, 2021, the neighborhood group METRAC, Council Fire, Daniels, Fred Victor, the Neighborhood Pods, and many more organizations came together online to hold an event in honor of the Nation Day of Remembrance and Action to stop violence against women. The event called Amplifying Voices and Experiences was held in memory of the December 6, 1989 Ecole Polytechnique murder of 14 women and the 10 other women and 4 men who were injured in the anti-feminist attack. Now this event is all about amplifying voices and experiences and we're going to be exploring the impact of mental health and isolation on Indigenous, Black and racialized communities during two years of navigating a global pandemic. The event featured a jingle dress dance, spoken word, singing, hand drumming and panel discussions. Ontario COVID-19 modeling suggests province will see rise in cases, COVID-19 cases and hospitalizations in Ontario will continue to rise substantially even without the Omicron variant if vaccination do not increase and further public health measures are not implemented. New modeling data released by the province's science table suggests. The modeling is uh, disconcerting. We're seeing a, a continued rise in cases across Ontario and its impact on the healthcare system. And to me, as a public health physician, all of uh, the cases, uh, for the most part, are preventable. It saddens me deeply to see the vast majority of individuals in our intensive care units, uh, they're, they're unvaccinated. They never took advantage of the means to protect themselves. We know these vaccines are safe. They're effective. They will decrease the severity of infection in Ontarians. Uh, and uh, uh, it's absolutely preventable what is happening in our acute care sector. Uh, so I, I really would 
uh, ask all Ontarians to reflect deeply. If you haven't been vaccinated yet, please reconsider. Um, they are highly beneficial uh, to you as an individual, to your family, to the community. Uh, they will decrease the impact on our acute care sector. The modelling is predicting a rise in cases which I think we all knew would occur as we head indoors in crowded spaces and close spaces. I am concerned about the coming months uh, and its potential impact on our health care system uh, and hence uh, you know, our fate is in our hands. We can wash them, we can use them to put a mask on uh, and we can find the nearest clinic where we can provide uh, the safe and effective vaccines. At least 13 cases of the Omicron variant have been detected so far in the province and the London Ontario Health Unit is investigating a potential cluster of 30. And now we continue with events and jobs in Regent Park with Javin Hawk. Thank you. Now for upcoming events in Regent Park. Team Toronto presents Toronto Kids Vaccine Day at Scotiabank Arena. On Sunday, December 12th, Toronto's youngest will have a chance to receive their COVID-19 vaccine at the Scotiabank Arena as a part of Toronto Kids Vaccine Day. The event will be running from 10 a.m. to 6 p.m. The superhero-themed vaccine clinic will be hosted by Toronto Public Health alongside Sick Kids bringing doctors and nurses who are experts in speaking with children and caregivers about vaccines. While creating a child-friendly, fun and positive space and vaccination experience. Hi, I'm Mary John Torrey and I'm inviting Toronto families to come down to Scotiabank Arena right here for Toronto Kids Vaccine Day on Sunday, December 12th from 10 in the morning till 6 at night. We're holding a special and fun clinic just for kids ages 5 to 11 to receive their COVID-19 vaccine. Be a superhero in the home of some of Toronto's favourite sports teams and take part in the fun activities all right here at Scotiabank Arena. Our favourite mascots, the Raptor and Carlton the Bear, they'll be here welcoming you and cheering on all of Toronto's newest superheroes and that means you kids. So for more information or to book an appointment, visit toronto.ca slash COVID-19. Let's all get down here to Scotiabank Arena on December the 12th. There will be vaccines available for children ages 5 to 11 years old. Children must be turning 5 by the end of 2021. There will also be two ongoing vaccination clinics for children ages 5 to 11. One is here in Regent Park and the other one will be running in St. Jamestown. The Children's Clinic here in Regent Park is run by the Regent Park Community Health Centre and it will take place on Saturdays from 8.30 a.m. to 12.30 p.m. at 40 Oak Street. The St. James Town's vaccination pop-up clinic will be held Fridays, Saturdays and Sundays from 9.30 p.m. to 4.30 p.m. at the Wellesley Community Centre at 495 Sherburn Street. Vaccinations will be appointment only and open to residents with the following postal codes M5A, M5B, M4X, and M4Y. For more information and to book an appointment, visit regionparkchc.org slash COVID-19 vaccination clinic or stjamestown.org. If you have any questions or concerns about the vaccine or vaccination for children, you can talk to a doctor and experts in over 200 languages through Vax Facts. Book online to talk to a doctor about your concerns at www.shn.ca slash Vax Facts or call 416-438-2911 extending 57 838. The Regent Park Cultural Bazaar is having a holiday market organized by youths and grassroots of Regent Park. The holiday market will take place on Friday, December 17th from 4 p.m. to 8 p.m. at the Daniel Spectrum Building, 585 Dundas Street East, on the first floor lobby. The market will feature local artisans and designers and there will also be food, arts and crafts, henna and live music. It's going to be a very fun community event.
Come say hi to your neighbors and, and shop local for these holidays. For more information, please contact Shabana by email at shabana-moprp at gmx.com or by phone at 647-640-4664. Every Wednesday in Regent Park, pop-up COVID-19 testing clinics will be available. It began to run this past Wednesday, December 1st. The testing clinic is open from 3.30 p.m. to 6.30 p.m. every Wednesday and is opera operated by the Regent Park Community Health Center out 440 Oak Street. The testing site is open for individuals who have COVID-19 symptoms or are exposed to someone with a positive COVID-19 test. People with no immigration status and no fixed address are welcome. No questions asked. Bring your OHIP card if you have one, but it is not required. Appointments are preferred by walk-ins, will be accommodated if possible. To book or for any questions, please contact the Regent Park Community Centre by phone at 416-364-2261 or contact Shraddha Pandey at 416-364-3030, extending 2277, or by email at shraddha p at org. Healing as One in partnership with the City of Toronto is organizing Girls and Boys Drop-In Basketball Nights. Girls Drop-Ins are running on Mondays while Boys Drop-Ins are on Saturdays. Both are ongoing and run from 7 p.m. to 10 p.m. at the Regent Park Community Centre at 402 Shooter Street. And lastly, free leisure swims for youths ages 10 to 24 at the Paul McConnell Aquatic Center on Wednesdays from 7.15 p.m. to 8 p.m., Sundays from 4.45 p.m. to 5.30 p.m., and at the Wellesley Community Center every Friday from 6.15 p.m. to 8 p.m. All participants must register for each swim at www.toronto.ca slash swim. Swimmers 18 years and older must provide proof of vaccinations. That was all for Regent Park's events. Hope to see you soon. Do you have talent? Open call. Focus Media Arts Center in partnership with the SDP Planning Committee is starting a database of residents who have talent and who are interested in performing for the community. Performers can also include music groups, singers, dancers, poets, and stand-up comedians. Performance will be paid. Send a brief artist bio to info at focusmediaarts.ca. The Toronto Community Housing Corporation, TCHC, is hiring for part-time seasonal positions and full-time work. Some of the available jobs posted include tutors for the after-school program called Home Run Scholars for children in grade 1 to 6 building cleaning and maintenance, data entry clerk, senior communications advisor, and senior program leader, among other opportunities. To learn more about all the available positions and joining the TCHC workforce, please head over to torontohousing.ca slash careers. The Sherburne Health Center has a few openings they are looking to fill. Positions include clinic engagement and safety worker, registered practical nurse, education and training specialist. For more information on these jobs, visit the Sherburne Health Center website, sherburne.on.ca slash careers. And that's all for today's show. My name is Murphy Brown, and my co-hosts are Fred Alvarado, Jabin Hawk, Corbin Milo, and Anna Maria Iguera. We also would like to thank our team of researchers who contributed to this week's show. And from our studios at Focus Media Arts Center, thank you for watching and see you next week.
Make sure to like, comment, and subscribe. And when you do subscribe, hit the little notification bell so you never miss out on any of our content. If you'd also like more, you can find us on our other social media platforms. And if you want even more, you can look at our website. Thank you.